So uh, we're gonna we're gonna we are coming to the to the uh, to the end of the of this meeting. I hope uh, you uh, you enjoy everything. And, and, and of, of course, it's like the wine. We, we try, I mean, it's always a challenge to keep everybody up to the end, obviously. So I'm very grateful for the two remaining speakers and good friends who have accepted to, uh, to conclude uh, the uh, Emerald Congress. But they will discuss something that you're going to see. It's, I would say, a hot topic and should remain a concern. And, and, and this is the radiatory occlusion. Uh, as you know, I mean, Amoridial, we, we love and we like to discuss the issue we have been facing in our daily practice. And I think those two trials exactly discuss one issue that people have been using against radialists for many, many years. It's still not a perfect situation. I don't think we have the perfect solution to solve radiatory occlusion, but I think you're going to hear, uh, that I think the two, the two most important trials that will be performed ever in that area. And I think that there is very interesting question of, of course, and controversy after both of the trials. And, and uh, so I'm very grateful for first uh, Dr. Aminyan from Belgium that will discuss uh, the rap and beat uh, trial and then uh, uh, my friend Sam Pancholi from US who will be discuss the uh, profit to, uh, to trial. Thank you. Adel. So, dear, dear colleagues, uh, dear chairman, thank you very much for the invitation, and it's my pleasure on behalf of all the co-investigators of the Rapid Beat Trial and on behalf of Dr. Saito, which could not be present today, to present you this, uh, this uh, clinical trial. So, I have no relevant uh, financial interest to disclose regarding this presentation. So, the background, the widespread use of the trench radial access is currently limited by the small size of the radial artery so that the use of a sheet which is larger than the inner lumen of the radial artery, as you know, will promote several unfavorable features like vascular injury and has been demonstrated to be a strong predictor of radial artery occlusion. We know from previous trial that use of a 5 French sheet is associated with a lower rate of radial artery occlusion than a 6 French sheet, but at the expense of limited backup support and restriction in the use of adjunctive devices in case of complex PCI. So the six French glide sheet slender is a new developed thin wall uh, radial sheet um, which, ha which has an inner lumen uh, that can accommodate any six French catheter and which has an outer diameter uh, that approach uh, the average diameter of current standard five French sheet. And that is due to the, the reduction in the thickness of the sheet. Uh, so the, the, the application of this new radial sheet has the potential to decrease invasiveness and also to, to allow the, the treatment of a, a broad range of coronary lesions. But it is unclear uh, up to now if the use of this new sheet will result in similar rate of radial artery occlusion than a standard 5 French sheet. So besides sheet size, we have seen several times uh, and also yesterday that um, the hemostasis uh, protocol also plays a very important role uh, for the prevention of radar to occlusion. And uh, Dr. Pancholi has uh, shown several times the importance of a patent hemostasis protocol as a very effective strategy to reduce radar to occlusion. So we have performed a, a multi-center randomized trial and we have included 1,926 patients which were randomized at 12 sites in the US, uh, in Japan, and in Europe and patients were randomized one-to-one -one ratio to receive the glide sheet slender six French or the standard five French glide sheet from Terumo. In order to assess the relative importance of sheet size and uh, hemostasis protocol, we perform in each group a second randomization comparing patent hemostasis as described by Samir Pancholi against the institutional hemostasis protocol. So there were 88 patients that were excluded from the trial because of uh, insufficient data or failed radial puncture, which was uh, an exclusion criteria, leaving uh, 1,838 patients for the final analysis. The primary endpoint of the trial was the occurrence of radar arterial occlusion, which was assessed by Doppler ultrasound imaging at the time of discharge or the next day after the procedure uh, maximum. The secondary endpoint uh, included procedural success, which was defined as uh, successful completion of the procedure through the initially selected radial route, 
the occurrence of vascular access complication, local bleeding that were um, graded according to the easy criteria, uh, the occurrence of radial spasm, total procedural time, total contrast volume, total radiation dose, sheet failure, which was defined as any sheet malfunction leading to vascular complication uh, or procedural failure, and pain score. So the trial was powered for non-inferiority on the primary endpoint. Um, we calculated the sample size based on the assumption of a rate of radar to occlusion of 5% in the 5 range group. And we selected a non-inferiority margin of 2.5% for the risk difference. And then uh, we estimated that the assignment of 1,900 patients in a one-to-one -one ratio will provide a power of 80% to demonstrate non-inferiority with a one-sided alpha level of 2.5%. So this was an investigator-initiated trial and sponsored by NPO International TRI Network, which is led by Dr. Saito, and data entry was conducted through Internet access. You have on the, on the right of the screen the, the including centers and the number of patients that were included in uh, the different centers with the PI uh, investigator on the left. So there was five centers in Japan five in Europe and two in, uh, in the U.S., so it's one of the first intercontinental uh, trial uh, assessing this Im important question. Uh, the inclusion uh, started in October 2014 and ended up in the uh, end of March 2016. So you have here in the slide the baseline clinical and procedural characteristic of the, of the study population. What is important to see is that uh, the, the, the rate of previous homolateral radial access was basically the same in both group and around 27%. Heparin was the most uh, commonly used anticoagulant therapy uh, in the vast majority of patients. Uh, in the six French slender group, the, the, the mean catheter size was slightly but significantly uh, bigger than in the five French group. And also interestingly, and that will be a subject of discussion, very few patients uh, went, uh, underwent PCI in this study because most of the centers were doing drug diagnostic angiogram followed by uh, elective PCI. So there were only 250 patients that had PCI during this uh, trial um, with no difference between uh, the two groups. So if you look uh, at the secondary outcome, which were basically procedural outcome, we see that there were, there were no difference in the, in the rate of procedural success between the two sheets, and also no difference in all secondary endpoints, including local bleeding, vascular access seat complication, rate of spasm, which I think it's important to note, pain score, and sheet failure. Regarding now, what, what is of interest is the primary endpoint, which is the rate of radar R2 occlusion. We see that uh, this occurred in 32 patients in the six French slender group, yielding an overall rate of 3.47% uh, in this group, as compared to only 16 uh, radial arterial occlusion in the five French group. So the risk difference was 1.73%, and the upper bound of the confidence interval for the risk difference was above uh, the pre-specified margin of 2.5%, and so statistical non-inferiority was not met in this clinical trial, which was basically due to the lower than expected rate of radar to occlusion in the five French group. If we look at the primary endpoint, the radar to occlusion, according to the hemostasis protocol, we found surprisingly that uh, the application of a patent hemostasis protocol was not associated with a reduction in the rate of radar arterial occlusion in the both group, the standard group, and the, the conventional group. And we can assume, uh, we can uh, argue that the, the low rate of radar arterial occlusion in, in both groups may have maybe precluded any additional benefit of applying a, a patent hemostasis protocol. You have in this slide the rate of radar arterial occlusion per site uh, and per continent. Um, you see that the U.S. was performing very well. In the two centers, they have a rate of radar arterial occlusion of 0%, which I think is great. The average rate of radar arterial occlusion in the European centers was 1.5%. In Japan, it was around 2.5%. And you can see that in the, the, the two uh, biggest recruiting centers in Japan, uh, that have included uh, almost 19, for more than 1,900 patients, you see that there is a significant difference in the rate of radar arterial occlusion. Of note, there were two European centers that were already using patent hemostasis as the institutional uh, hemostasis protocol uh, within this trial. And even if we 
add this patient in a per protocol analysis uh, in, the, in the group of patients that had patent hemostasis, we could still not find any significant advantage of applying a patent hemostasis protocol, although the rate of radar arterial occlusion was numerically uh, lower, uh, but not statistically significant. On secondary analysis, if we look uh, at the, the, the size of catheter and the rate of radar arterial occlusion in the five French group, we see that a very few patients were actually upsized to a six French sheet with only 36 patients, which with, there was only f less than 4% of patients uh, in which the operator, in whom the operator uh, upsized to a larger sheet than five French. And we didn't see any difference in the rate of radar arterial occlusion uh, in case of upsizing versus sticking to the five French sheet. However, we see that every time there was an upsize um, to, the, to a larger sheet than a five French sheet, it was associated with a higher rate of radial artery spasm, which was uh, statistically significant. We made also a multivariate analysis for the predictors of radar arterial, of radar arterial occlusion, and we found five independent predictors for the occurrence of uh, radar arterial occlusion. Uh, the use of a six French lender sheet, uh, the occurrence of pain during the procedure, uh, age of the patient with younger age uh, being a risk factor for uh, radar arterial occlusion, the fact that the, the, the hemostasis protocol was unsuccessful, which was defined as the fact that we could not remove the hemostasis device within six hours, and uh, aspirin as a, had a, had a protective effect on radar arterial occlusion. So if you try to summarize the result, we see that the overall incidence of radar arterial occlusion for the entire study cohort, uh, so 1,838 patients, was low at 2.61%. Despite our primary hypothesis that the new slender 6 French will provide similar rate of radar arterial occlusion, uh, this uh, could not be confirmed since statistical non inferiority was not achieved. We, we found five predictors of radar arterial occlusion, independent predictors, so use of the 6 French slender sheet, the occurrence of pain during procedure, younger age, failed hemostasis, and non-use of aspirin. And the use of a patent hemostasis protocol did not influence in our trial the rate of radar arterial occlusion in both groups. So why did the study fail to, to show non-inferiority? I think the, the, the answer is in this slide. Uh, if you look at the outer diameter uh, of the, of the six-inch slender sheet, you know that it's 2.46 millimeter, and de definitely that is the, the, the thinnest uh, six-inch sheet uh, available on the market. But if, if you look at the comparator in this trial, which was the five French glide sheet from Terumo, we see that the outer diameter is 2.29 millimeters, so you still have a zero 0.5 French difference between the two sheets, and this slight difference may explain, may explain partly the difference in the rate of radar arterial occlusion, and that emphasizes again the fact that even small difference in outer diameter can result in higher rate of radar arterial occlusion. Regarding the hemostasis protocol, it's important to note that uh, many, uh, many uh, recruiting centers were using, as the institutional uh, hemostasis protocol, uh, several protective uh, measures against radar arterial occlusion, namely the, the fact that uh, the, the, there was a very minimal pressure strategy and also the fact that uh, there was an early decompression of the hemostasis device. And this so-called rapid deflation technique has been shown to be associated with a very high rate of uh, radial artery patency and also to be associated with less radial artery occlusion than the standard deflation technique as provided by the manufacturer. So there are some limitations of this trial. First, it was a single blind trial, and the radial operators were aware of the randomized ass assignment. However, the outcome assessors for the primary endpoint were blinded. The low rate of PCI procedures in both groups may have precluded the benefit of using a six French sheet. And PCI procedures within the five French group were performed mostly with the use of five French guide catheter, reflecting, I think, lower PCI complexity, not requiring large bore guide catheters. And the study design did not allow, of course, a comparison against a standard six French radial sheet, and future studies uh, are needed to compare the six French standard sheet against uh, the standard six French sheet with focus on vascular access seat complication and radial arterial occlusion. But this has been shown yesterday with the, with the Access One study. So in this large multicenter randomized trial of patients undergoing transradial access, the six French slender from Terumo was associated with a low event rate for the primary endpoint 
Also, non-inferiority to the, to the file friend sheet was not confirmed. There was no significant difference between the two groups with regard to all secondary endpoints, including procedural success, vascular access seat complication, local bleeding, and uh, also spasm. And as compared to institutional hemostasis protocol, the use of a patent hemostasis protocol in this trial was not associated with a reduced rate of radial arterial occlusion in both groups as tested by this very experienced uh, radial centers. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so this is open for discussion, I guess, before we move to the next one. Uh, has anybody on the panel a specific question or comment? Or uh, I may, maybe I'll, I'll give a, a few, uh, comments and uh, more than ever. First of all, I think we should congratulate the sponsor, Dr. Saito and Terumu. I don't think that we will ever see a second randomized trial comparing sheet, including more than 2,000 patients. I discussed at the very beginning many times with uh, uh, Terumu the, the trial, and I think that they, sh they should be congratulated. If you think about radial, we don't have many large randomized trials. So in 2000, uh, uh, in 21st century, I think it's great. Second, in t we have also to focus on the methodology and, and go back to the assumption. The, the assumption was based on a non-inferiority with a 5% five, five reference rate. You basically have a, a, an absolutely astounding uh, result with an extremely low radiolatory occlusion. That's the main, that's the main result. That, that's right. Yeah. And it's excellent. Mm -mm. So at the end of the day, that's, I think that it provided both sheets are extremely, are extremely perfor performing. Definitely. In terms of methods, that's the only thing you can say. I mean, you, I mean, I understand, and it's very unbiased to, to discuss about yeah, that you didn't meet, you did not meet the um, non-inferiority uh, assumption, but that's not, in terms of method, that's not exactly correct, because when you miss the reference rate, I mean, you don't have the power. That's so you are just facing a type 2, the possibility of a type 2 error. And I think that we should be careful, because obviously I hope that this paper will be publish, published, obviously, and this will be used against, and, and, and you know, as you know, there will be, uh, let's, let's put it that way, politics. That's right. Yeah. The point is that in terms of methods, you get even better results than you assume. That's the main message. The, the and, and, and I think that both, now you can go in, there is some, of you see that there is some noise level in terms of basically even real puncture failure, which I'm surprised because, I mean, I guess all those sites were extremely experienced. I was puzzled by the fact that, uh, you know, when you go to the pattern hemostasis, pattern hemostasis, it's a technique. That's right. And uh, it's also obvious when you go into the detail that when you talk or when you apply the technique by the experts, and this is not very difficult because you are one of the experts, Sam is one of the experts, Ivo is one of the experts about pattern hemostasis. You have protocol inside your institution, it's routine. So that creates, by definition, excellent result. That's right. Then also the problem in terms of methods, because you were supposed to compare the, the, the pattern hemostasis was a superiority arm. So you were supposed, supposed to be better than conventional technique. But if the conventional technique in those sites is also pattern hemostasis, yeah, that's right. you are comparing to yourself, which is the best, and it's shown. You have 0%. That's right. And, and again, I mean, I, it, you, you went fast, but some, some sites at like 20% of original to occlusion rate, which is something that... It is known, and I think that we also will, will, will uh, hear from Sam afterwards. But again, it maybe means that the, the technology or the devices have been so much optimized, and I, I don't want to be branded, but I think we should give credit to the company who developed those sheets. They are excellent, and maybe the sheet now are so good that the pattern hemostasis maybe is not that important because at the end of the day, you get like a 2% original occlusion mm -hmm. proven by echo duplex, yeah, which yeah. is also an excellent point. That's right. We're not arguing about the pulse or the no, uh, that's oximetry. Right. That's right. This is really the, best, the mm -hmm. best way. And the, the last point I will make, this was assessed at hospital discharge or the next day. Mm -hmm. And we do know that this is even higher than maybe third days later. That's right, that's right. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody can make another comment, but uh, that's my feeling. 
Definitely, it's not to, to go against patent and as, as I said, a lot of, uh, including centers, were using something very, very close to patent hemostasis, but without systematic assessment of the radial pulse and, and uh, compression of the ulnar artery, but minimal pressure strategy. So there was a lot of preventive measure. Uh, and also, I think the, the main message is, okay, you have to tailor the choice of your sheet according to the indication. If you have a center doing, for example, a lot of uh, diagnostic angiogram, no, no need for me personally to use a six-run slender sheet. Uh, but if you have a center doing a lot of, uh, you have a high volume of acute coronary syndrome or uh, you do a lot of ad hoc PCI, maybe the slender sheet is better as a worker sheet in your cat lab. Uh, so I think the main message is to tailor it to know that if you go for a, let's say, bigger sheet, you must expect uh, a higher rate of occlusion, although, as you said, it was very low in this, in this trial. And this is a good news, yeah, definitely. But again and again, maybe Sam will discuss it. You know, when we, when you see the result about pattern hemostasis, first of all, and I've been very, I would say, critical uh, about this because everybody in the, you know, we know now in the world, everybody is a radialist, and second, everybody is doing pattern hemostasis because pattern hemostasis is like free radicals. You know, it's a buzzword. Everybody, in fact, for many guys, doing pattern hemostasis means minimal pressure. That's not the technique how it was described. That's right. It's again a technique which has been to be mastered. And again, sometimes I even look and discuss with the result with Sam. You know, it's very viable. I mean, you can get pattern hemostasis and you discuss 5%, sometimes even more. Uh, so, you know, there is viability. And it's clear, I mean, again, and I will emphasize that because I'm, I think that you, Sam, and, and Ivo, I mean, you basically develop the expertise of your staff. Your staff are probably the most trained in the world, and they are perfect. But is it replicable in the world? You know, I, I, I'm saying that because in my own place, I've been unable to convince about any pattern hemostasis. My colleagues are zero interest about pattern hemostasis. I'm fighting for five years. I'm measuring the echo. My radial occlusion rate by echo is uh, 20%. The same day. It's awful. The worst. Mm. And they don't want to hear about using slender sheet. We use the pinnacle, so the, the regular one, because we, we want to have a backup plan if we need to go femoral and be 35 wire compatible so it's easy they've been doing it for 20 years so they don't want to change and they just use the, the emo band because there is no bleeding so there are extreme so but i think that the new uh, i would say at the end of the day the the devices which have been developed are probably more important than the technique thank you uh, I've, I've spoken a lot but i'll have a, a quick comment um, I'm not terribly convinced in terms of we need to, I mean, I, we know that patent hemostasis and uh, the time of the clamp might be viable, but I'm not terribly convinced that we need to keep the band for three or four hours. Um, you mentioned in your discussion that paper from your, your intervention that was comparing peers with apples because uh, they compare like rapid uh, 50 minutes deflection compared to the standard manufacturer mm. advices that is about four hours. Um, um, what we know so far is after some uh, paper is two hours, then we know that is 50 units kilo hairpin, and the bigger the shift, that's or the smaller the shift. So I don't know if the message. Um, should be, you know, we need to keep the clamp more than four hours as a methodology in, 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 a, in, a, in a regular cat lab. Rodrigo, I mean, maybe Dr. Matsukage or Dr. Yomashi or Shimashi can comment, but we have had that discussion. It seems that Japanese patients are very different. I mean, you cannot expect to stop any devices below three hours. Correct but, me if I'm wrong, but it seems that there is something they don't understand. It's not like uh, the other population. It seems that the patient requires a longer time inflation, uh, a longer hemostatic time that Dr. Saito mentioned uh, at Emoidia. What do you think, Dr. Matsukage? Is it true? One French per hour. You see? So you go six French, six hours. Five French sheets is a compression time is the average of five hours. Uh, I, that's, that's, yeah, but it's bizarre because my patients uh, six hours after PCI are home. Um, I send a patient for <laughs> four hours after completing the thing. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know. They don't stop bleeding in Japan. But, but, but that, that the bleeding is depending on the, the final 
procedural ACT, or is something uh, not related to that? Because uh, you see Dr. Lavi uh, presented yesterday, we, you know, comparing 20 to 60 minutes, and we have at one week 0.9% of relative occlusion. But you know, even uh, Dr. Miyoshima, she using, when you use the slender technique, like the virtual three French, what is the most easy time? I think it's longer in Japan, no? Yes, three French is three hours. Oh, <laughs> one French, one hour. Uh, that is an ordinary Japanese strategy. <laughs> Four French, four. Four hours. I don't know the reason, but uh, five French, five hours. Six is six hours. <laughs> it's a very simple rule. Huh? Have, you tr have you tried to reduce it, or you don't try? Because, I mean, Dr. Saito claims that the patients are bleeding for a long time. Yes, but uh, uh, there are many institute hospitals, and uh, they have uh, uh, their own way to hematosis. Uh, the, maybe many, in many uh, hospitals, nurse or young physician uh, release hematosis band or something. So it's very difficult to uh, change the, that way. So if we want to change or shortening the time, uh, I have to check by myself. So it's very difficult. That is the reason why the, uh, one French is one, uh, one French is one hour, maybe. We, we used uh, f probably f four or three hours a few years ago, and now at most we use one hour. So, you know, just try and see what happens. Yes. <laughs> okay. One question to you. Uh, what do you think? What is the pathogenesis uh, in, in behind the radial artery occlusion? Stretching of the sheet, creating the hole of the sheet, or micro dissection, or what is what is in behind? Because very rare complication, but two percent exist. So, yeah, because there is, there was a difference between five and six French and eight French. So maybe the stretching or the creating a big hole. Maybe we need another closure devices for the radial artery. So now, it's, uh, I think it's, it would be important to understand what is in behind, or, or the or the needle related dissection. Because we I think the, the, the occurrence of radar occlusion is definitely multifactorial. So it depends on many, many things, uh, the level of anticoagulation, sheet size, etc. Et so in this trial, I think all these factors were well balanced due to the randomization. Uh, uh, so I cannot imagine that in one group there were more uh, trauma to the artery than the other. So I think what comes up at the end is that the fact that the, the slender sheet is a little bit larger than the other one, and then you must expect more patients that had a sheet to artery ratio above one, and more trauma to the radial artery, and that explains this very slight difference in the auto diameter, uh, explain, in my opinion, the difference uh, in, in, uh, in this very small difference in the rate of radial artery occlusion. That, that's my explanation. About, uh, because I'm recognizing uh, some uh, radial artery occlusions, which are symptomatic, of course, and I see short occlusions and long occlusions. Long, long occlusions are caused by the wire, okay. the sub subintimal passage of mm -hmm. the wire, and they will occlude in, in, yeah. in hours. But short occlusions, are, uh, they have uh, a, sh uh, a problem where it was punctured, or, yeah. or the compression bandage, or the, the focal the problem of the sheet. I can unfortunately not respond because this was not assessed uh, within the trial, the, uh, if it was a long occlusion or so on. We just had the, the, the diagnosis of occluded or not, but uh, no, no mention about the, the type of occlusion. Yeah. I, I think from practical perspective, what we know, don't use five French slender, uh, six French slender instead of five just because, you know, it's kind of the same. So it's not. And what we need to compare is five French slender to five French, six French slender to six French. Yes. What happens. Mm. So, okay, so maybe we should move to the next uh, talk and we will continue to discuss uh, radial artery occlusion and more importantly, its prevention. So, uh, Sam, you, you are the master to conclude the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Olivier, and thanks again for the opportunity and a beautiful program. So, I have to commend you for single handedly pulling it off, even though we are all on the steering committee. I know how much work I do, so I can't speak for everybody else. 
Um, so again, wonderful, and um, thank you. I think you know we've learned in the discussion uh, that radio occlusion is multifactorial. And the, the biggest thing we forget is that the number one predictor is the patient subset. And that's why e even in our own lab, we keep seeing different rates of occlusions in different data sets with the same group of operators and technique. And that's the only variable which is changing is the patient. So, um, and now we are hearing that the Japanese population has a drastic difference from the Western population, where uh, a three French sheath takes uh, three hours to close, uh, which I think is, you know, amazing. And it's true. And the surprising and the, the beautiful part of all this is, you know, how much we learn as we go along. You know, when, when I was um, initially reviewing, pe pe uh, you know, articles for journals, I used to always suspect foul play when the results were deviant. And then I promptly realized that it's, it's not really foul play. Foul play occurs, but not as frequently as we are paranoid about but there is a huge unknown that we learn constantly from. And so I think, you know, this is a great example of that. So let me uh, tell you about another direct product of AIM radio. Uh, the, you know, this is uh, the PROFIT-2 trial. As the acronym, it will say, Prevention of uh, Radio Artery Occlusion, the Prophylactic Hyperperfusion Evaluation Trial. The reason hyperperfusion is because uh, we'll talk about how to induce it. But again, some of the stuff we already talked in the, in the lecture so far, radio artery occlusion obviously is important. Uh, using best practices, the incidence has come down. Although if you look at uh, uh, respectable laboratories around the world, it's still, depending on when it is measured, at least at 24 hours, there is a good 10% incidence uh, in 2015, which is not at all insignificant. So patent hemostasis as a concept reduces the risk of radio artery occlusion. And more and more as we hear all of you present, I'm starting to realize that it's more of a Hawthorne effect. The fact that we think of preventing radio occlusion and paying attention to radio patency already drops your radio artery occlusion rate. And then if you institute a specific maneuver, you might fail to show an, a further improvement. And I think that's what we are dealing with in all these data sets. Uh, compared to 2007, there is no argument that we have reduced the rates of radio artery occlusion. Uh, patent hemostasis, like Olivier said, is a buzzword, it's an intelligent word, and so there is a high rate of cognitive adoption. But when you go to the individual high-class laboratories, there is a low rate of operational adoption, and many people interpret it very differently and frequently very wrongfully, and so the actual practice of patent hemostasis is largely unknown and probably low. So the reason for that is because patent hemostasis comes with a bunch of baggage. It needs uh, a big buy-in from the non-physician team of the cath lab. The, the, the non-physician team has to understand the local forearm anatomy and circulatory physiology in order to get a clear idea of how to practice patent hemostasis. And obviously, it increases the contact time with the patient after the procedure, which is both uh, costly and annoying to some of the individuals because the reason they switched to transradial was to eliminate the hemostatic contact. And the, the biggest problem is radio artery occlusion is largely clinically silent. So nobody comes with a blue hand if they close the radial artery. They pretty much uh, absorb it at home, don't even complain. And most of the problems, the minor problems that it is associated with, go away within a few days anyway. So at the end of the day, the radial artery closing is a silent problem that nobody wants to own. And that's one of the reasons why we felt uh, that there was a need to push it further from patent hemostasis. We needed to go a step further. We needed to eliminate the human uh, factor in it, which was uh, preventing the operational adoption. And that's where we started to play around with ulnar compression. Majority of the credit goes to Dr. Zian from Marshall Haman's lab, who, while practicing manual hemostasis, found that once you close the radial artery with manual hemostatic pressure, you can compress the ulnar and open up the radial artery uh, very quickly after that. Evo tested it uh, systematically in, in his lab and uh, published in 
American Journal of Cardiology, his experience, which showed that, yes, this could be clearly achieved. And with Olivier's uh, radial dinners, we sat down one of these years and uh, discussed this and started to work in our own ultrasound lab to see what are the effects of ulnar artery compression. And we clearly found that there is a major hyperperfusion effect when you compress the ipsilateral ulnar artery in the radial artery. So you can hyperperfuse the radial artery by compressing the ulnar artery. And that's where the protocol was born, which is uh, prophylactically compressing the ulnar artery ipsilaterally and inducing a higher f uh, f uh, peak flow velocity and uh, flow both in the radial artery and see if that has any impact on radial artery occlusion, mostly because we had originally observed that patency or flow in the radial artery prevents radial artery occlusion very effectively. So the PROFIT-2 study was designed, um, and the problem, the number one problem was the large sample size. As we talked about yesterday, radial artery occlusion studies are becoming impossible to do properly because the huge samples that we need because of the dropping rates of uh, radial occlusion. Uh, and so uh, I'll show you the sample size first. Uh, it was a binary outcome superiority design using the chi-square backbone. And we used a 2.8% uh, radial artery occlusion rate, which was probably a little bit lower than the contemporary rate at that time, but it was the lowest possible rate that we had in the labs that we were working with. Uh, and the reason we took the lower rate in the control arm is because we didn't want to be critical or, or criticize about having a, an inflated occlusion rate in the control arm, which shows the benefit of the interventional arm. Uh, and then from EVO's data from AJC, we used the 0.9% as the ulnar compression-related radial artery occlusion rate. And giving a power of 0.9 with, a, with alpha of 0.05, we were able to come close to a 3,000 patient randomized sample size. As you can see in this consort diagram, um, uh, 4,238 patients were uh, screened, and the randomization occurred uh, before hemostasis was to start. And so, you know, patients uh, with uh, conditions that would induce heterogeneity anywhere in this that would affect the outcome variable were excluded, and that included anybody who underwent PCI, because we have observed that the anticoagulation strategy with PCI is very variable, and antiplatelet treatment as well as the dosing of heparin, et cetera, is very variable. And so historically, we've always eliminated that, that subset from the hypothesis where we test purely radial artery occlusion. Uh, previous TRA, ipsilaterally, was excluded. Barbo pattern D was excluded only because the ulnar artery contribution was not expected in a large way. Uh, warfarin was excluded because uh, it still remains somewhat of an unknown. And if we did not have a palpable ulnar pulse to apply dedicated pressure, those were excluded. Uh, fairly low incidence of that. And 3,000 patients were randomized in Czech Republic and India uh, into group one, where a traditional five French coronary angiogram was performed with patent hemostasis protocol afterwards. Uh, and group two, where patent hemostasis was then uh, enhanced or, or associated with ipsilateral ulnar compression. Uh, the analysis was done, as you, as you see in the bottom most rung of this consort diagram in so many patients. Uh, the procedure, uh, again, was a fairly standard procedure. Everybody received a vasodilator cocktail and 5,000 units of heparin. Uh, TR band was used, uh, and uh, it was applied for two hours at the minimum. Uh, plethysmography and, if needed, ultrasound was used. Ultrasound was available and was utilized whenever there was a uh, discrepancy in the, in, in the interpretation. And the trial was registered on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so this is how prophylactic ulnar ipsilateral compression was achieved. Uh, we did not have a dedicated device, and so any other band was allowed to be used in the larger subset of this trial in India, this is how it was used, uh, it was achieved. Um, for the radial, the TR band was used. The primary study endpoint was 30-day radial artery occlusion, and we had pre-specified a 100-patient ultrasound sub-study uh, where the ultrasound was done pre-procedurally and 30 days post-procedure, uh, mostly for the sake of assessing safety of the ulnar compression. 
the lumen diameter and wall thickness of both radial and ulnar arteries were measured uh, uh, at those two time points. Radial artery patency was evaluated after the index procedure at band removal, 24 hours uh, plus minus 24 hours and 30 days plus minus 24 hours of the procedure. Um, and this was the primary endpoint uh, outcome of the study. And as you can see, in the patent hemostasis arm in these labs, and I know Evo's lab is religious about patent hemostasis because he personally pays attention to it, but in India there are several operators and several nursing staff and technicians. And so you can see that at the removal of the band, quite a few of the radials were actually not having anti-grade flow. At 24 hours, there was recanalization, and, and a little bit further at 30 days in the control arm. But if you look at the prophylactic ulnar compression, you are essentially eliminating a lot of the discrepancy at the beginning of the process. And after that, there is stabilization. The bottom line is the 30-day radiology occlusion rate was still highly significantly reduced uh, from 3 to 0.9 percent, surprisingly matching very much close to Evo's finding in, in his uh, study. Uh, the baseline characteristics of the two populations, like any large study, were fairly well matched. And as you can see, uh, you know, from every angle, you know, height, weight, uh, diabetes distribution, gender distribution, all these known variables that do affect radiology occlusion, the two populations were fairly well matched. Uh, the periprocedural characteristics uh, were also, uh, you know, as shown here. And interestingly, the pain during compression, which we thought would be more in the group two, where both arteries were compressed, was actually higher in group one. And goes to show that uh, it has a lot to do with pain threshold than the actual uh, procedure. Uh, obviously, in some of the ulnar compression patients, the band had to be removed, and the threshold was fairly low to do that. But even then, 12 patients were all that actually required the removal of the band. Uh, there was no uh, other adversity found. In the last item on that table there, the patent hemostasis, as you can see, in the control arm was 74 percent, and in the group two, jumped up to 96 percent. And that's where I think the value of this protocol is, is that uh, if you believe that flow is a good antithrombotic, then enhancing flow will be enhancing antithrombotic activity. On univariate analysis between the, the patients who developed RAO versus not, uh, these were the predictors. Gender, as seen in multiple other data sets, predicted the occurrence of radiatory occlusion. Diabetes was associated with uh, radiatory occlusion. Age was associated, so the older patients got more radiatory occlusion. We don't know if that's because they are more diseased radials or not. Pain during compression was associated with uh, 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 a radiatory occlusion, interestingly, as we, sh as we saw in, in the rap and beat study as well. And obviously, patent hemostasis, the presence or absence of it was also associated. It was defined here, by the way, patent hemostasis was defined here as the ability to achieve patent hemostasis by the old protocol within the first 15 minutes of compression. Uh, when multivariable analysis was done, the ones circled in the, in the red were essentially uh, uh, shown to be independently predicting radiatory occlusion. And the interesting thing was ulnar compression, which was univariate predictor of radiatory occlusion, when in the multivariate model, when patent hemostasis was entered, ulnar artery compression was not a predictor. And what it really told us is that patent hemostasis is a mediator variable as defined by the effect size, uh, statistically speaking. And so the way ulnar compression mediated mitigation of radiology occlusion was by enhancing patent hemostasis and its effect. So once again, the endpoints that we studied, the primary endpoint of 30-day RAO, uh, was significantly reduced in the cohort receiving prophylactic ipsilateral ulnar compression. The limitations of this study was that these were, this is a two-center uh, study, not a 20-center study, and both centers had high uh, 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 TR uh, you know, experience, uh, very high expertise in transradial procedures, uh, short procedure durations. Uh, PCIs were not included, 
and we don't have information on what happens with larger sheet size or for that matter even smaller sheet size. This was a five French only study. Let's talk a little bit about the potential mechanisms. Why would we expect this and why did this happen? Well, increase in radio artery flow caused by a sudden decrease in palmar resistance and because the palm has a given capacitance, when you compress the ulnar artery, the palmar resistance quickly drops and it recruits flow through the radial artery. That probably does a bunch of things that we don't even know, but the two that we could probably imagine are flow-mediated vasodilatation because of a sudden increase in flow, which might re uh, alleviate some of the residual spasm that we see. Uh, and as uh, Sasko and uh, Surya Dharma's paper on exit cocktail, lowering the risk of radial artery occlusion, maybe a mechanism here. Increase in peak flow velocity, which plays very favorably in the stress distribution around the puncture site in a collapsible pipe. And all those who are engineers, like Olivier, probably understand it more than I do, but uh, I've been told that uh, you know the radial artery has a problem with the distribution of stress, exactly opposite to femoral artery, where the one likes to bleed and the other one likes to clot. And so here we are trying to push the wall up a little bit so that it would not collapse. That's the very crude and basic uh, explanation. But these are speculations, obviously. We have no proof of this. The mechanism, which is very obvious in my lab and in Tejas's lab where this was done, is the continuous radial patency monitoring by using plethysmography, by removing ulnar contribution, and using the automated alarms to signal radial flow interruption is probably the biggest reason why this works, because it takes away the factor of cooperation and motivation of the staff. So if your alarm is going crazy because your radial artery went down, you're more motivated to get up and take care of it, as opposed to feeling noble and compressing on the ulnar artery to see if the radial is patent. And I think you know multiple mechanisms are at play here, but at the end of the day, when our first year fellow starts the fellowship, it takes about a week to be convinced that ulnar compression is the way to go. We rarely have to uh, really explain to a fellow that they should be applying a hemoband anymore on every radial artery. Uh, and the way it works is by promoting more patent hemostasis uh, or keeping the radial patent during hemostatic compression. And the best part of this study was that this was a direct product of the international transradial community, and I commend Olivier for leading this effort and succeeding for five straight years. Thank you. Okay, so this is open. Shah, you have a, a yeah. comment or question? Uh, congratulations for doing that, such a large randomized trial on radial artery occlusion. I have a question about the rate of uh, occlusion in your study. You mentioned 2.8 percent, or predicted 2.8 percent, uh, and you know all the numbers were higher in the control group. Um, wh when is the time that you are referring to, or when did you expect the 2.8 percent uh, yep. immediately after next day, and why was it higher? 30 days. So you know because our primary study endpoint was. 30-day occlusion, we sample size to that uh, duration. And so it's much nicer to do a study with a 24-hour rate of occlusion because you get a larger discrimination and so a smaller sample size, uh, which is a cheaper way of doing a study. But our goal was to do 30-day occlusion because of this whole issue of uh, poo-pooing radial artery occlusion because most of them recanalize. Well, we know that after one month, very rare case will re, you know, recanalize over the long run. Uh, if you're closed by one month, you'll probably be closed for good. Uh, so. if I, uh, congratulations to a very nice study. I like it very much. And let me uh, just take a look behind the curtain. You mentioned uh, the um, vasodilatation uh, mediated by the flow. I am um, a little bit um, skeptical about this because the vasodilatation, which is mediated by flow, is uh, related to a very healthy endothel. But this is an unhealthy endothel, that's the point, I think. In this situation, there's an endothelial dysfunction, and the endothelium, the bad endothelium, releases a lot of substances which makes uh, vasoconstriction and thrombo thrombosis. These substances uh, can be, uh, can be 
release them, let them go away from this part of the of the of the radial sheet um, related part. So that's I can I can imagine that can be one of the points when you can uh, help. And I like it very much because this is a uh, goes a little bit closer to the basic, the pathophysic basic of the of the occlusion. Sure. Thank you. No, I think the. You know, the FMD is a pure speculation. We have no proof of that. We have actually not even been able to measure it on ultrasound. The radial artery does not grow in, in diameter when you press the ulnar artery noticeably. And if you hook up a sheath to the pressure, the pressure doesn't go significantly up in most radial arteries. Now, the interesting thing is the smaller the radial, the larger the difference from baseline to compression. So. And we published that in uh, JIC last year, a much larger you know, experience of ultrasound measurement. And we found that there was an inverse relationship between the increment in flow and the radial artery diameter. So it actually fits very well, because those are the small arteries that will close on you when you press on them. But if you compress the ulnar, you'll get a bigger flow increase in those arteries. So maybe you know this is just a perfect intersection of uh, taking advantage of the, of the physiology in the, in the right substrate, as Sunil will call the, the you know, risk utilization you know, paradox doesn't exist here anyway. So, so some concrets. Uh, I'm a big fan of the, the story of renal occlusion and, and patent hemostasis. Do you think that we are, we don't, we are, we are not in, in, in a good time to look at differences in terms of radial clamps? Um, because I always keep in mind your, your thought is maintaining flow um, because the risk is not always, you know, because of an anatomical feature, different type of, you know, the, the, the circumference, uh, you know, tiny wrist, bigger wrist. But also we know that there are clamps that are considered occluders and also they are con considered more compressors. I did a kind of uh, review in that, tried to convince my, my colleagues <laughs> Uh, not using certain type of uh, radial clamp, and I figured out that the mechanism in terms of how ma how how we exceed pressure localized, whereas more uh, a, b a bigger bigger path with smooth, and yeah. therefore you can obtain more direct constant flow. Mm -hmm. Because again, we know the heparin, we know the patent hemostasis, we know the, the smaller the sheath, but I think we are forgetting in trying to improve the, the, mm, the features mm -hmm. of particular, because we cannot extend all of these, uh, we can extend the use of heparin, we can ex extend the use of small sheets, but if we have in the market 20 types of, of, of um, clamps, well, that might be a good point to, to tackle. Sure. So I think, you know, that's a very important point is that, you know, uh, when we studied patent hemostasis, we had, in America, we did not have the, the TR band. It was done with the hemo band. Uh, so, you know, our PROFIT-1 trial was not done with any fancy band. It was hemo band. It was just the concept of lowering pr pressure. But what you are alluding to is highly supported by the engineers. Um, if you talk to a guy who designs oil, you know, pumping pipelines, and especially flexible pipes that pump fluid, and how a rent in that pipe behaves, which my father actually happens to be one of those people. <laughs> and uh, to them, this is a no-brainer. So, and I, I learned that when I was looking at Bill O'Neill's band, where he had a reflector on it. And so just to kind of briefly elaborate on the concept, there are two kinds of stresses that the artery has. One that comes from the lumen and tries to force blood through your hole, into the exterior, and you're trying to fight that pressure by compressing to get hemostasis. Hemostasis, as the name implies, is stasis allowing for the blood to coagulate. Stasis means you have to stop that flow in the puncture. So that radial stress is pointing outside the hole. But there's a second kind of stress, which is pulsatile stress in the, in the you know, human or any other blood vessels. If you compress proximally, you will stop that pulsatile press, you know, stress to a very large extent. Even if your lumen is receiving pulsatile blood flow, the wall stops shaking. We learned that from the Bill O'Neill band where he had a reflector on it. And when we used to put a brachial blood pressure cuff, even though we had flow going through, 
the pulsation became very minor. The radial artery is a perfect place because the wall is thick and the hole is long. So just like I said yesterday, if you had to plug an opening, would you rather put a nail or would you rather put a thumbtack in it? If you have a thumbtack with a very wide diameter and a short height, it'll pop off very quickly. That's why most of the corks are made long. Their radius to height ratio is very, very small. If you stop the pulsatile stress, you will make that ratio favorable. You'll make your clot long instead of flat. And that's where the length of the band, as you're alluding to, you know, comes in. So the broader devices work better because they stop the pulsatile stress upstream and give you a smaller diameter opening and allow you to have that ratio of the radius to height in a favorable fashion. I'm glad you brought it up because every time I bring it up in America, people roll their eyes back saying, oh, we're not here for engineering. We just want to hear, you know, biology. So it's so, so a very important concept, I think. And we are finally understanding hemostasis in arteries with punctures on the surface. You know, I've been asking hemodynamic gurus like Blaise Carabello and Morton Kern for the last 10 years to explain to me what is the hemodynamics of, hemo of hemostasis? And brilliant as they are, they had very little in the way of contribution to that. They just admitted that we don't know. And I think we have to go to the engineers and the, the, you know, uh, peop you know, the uh, uh, experts in the other fields to kind of get an understanding of this. Yes, the, I would just make a comment because I had the personal experience. I, you know, I was very frustrated because we have been using the ammo band in my place, so the idea was crushing with a, you know, like a piece of uh, soft, let's say not so soft. So I think the first thing for me was the patient have pain, mm -hmm. and I don't like it. So I, have a, I had a company who was interested, and my idea at first was to have some like of a polymer which would be soft, and to be like a two dollars size, and the patient immediately love it. I, it's still a bracelet type, so I was also willing to have something very cheap. It, the patient love it, but then I realized that I, when I'm trying to remove it after three, four hours, it's re-bleeding. Mm -hmm. And they want to go home with the bracelet because they, they feel comfortable, and I cannot do it. And so the guy just said, okay, now we're going to extend, and there is a second piece with mm -hmm. the, the device, which is called the bangle, a second piece just to have a larger, mm -hmm. and then it works. It works great. And, and I think so the patient is still comfortable, but then you get hemostasis because I was thinking that I wanted exactly to go the smaller, to, to ease the patient and remove the pain. And in fact, there is no increase in pain, but you, you become effective. And I think, you know, what also happens when you have focal severe compression on the aperture is you have what's called applanation dilatation, which means if you put your finger in the hole, you're actually going to make it yeah. bigger. And that affects that ratio of the radius to height of the cork. So if you have a cork which is high radius, small height, it'll pop off in a soda bottle. But if you have a long cork, it works better. And, and I think it's interesting because obviously we don't want to be branded, but all, I mean, if you look at some devices even from China and, and try very, very neat, but probably to try to save some money, they try to be as small as possible. And they are very nice in terms of efficacy to make like this, but they are not very effective in terms of hemostasis because they should go, in fact, more bulky. Yeah. I think the Bengal band with, with the, the brick on the band worked ve you know, very well because of that. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. Push the button. I have only one short comment uh, from my center. Uh, we need to maintain good blood pressure during the uh, compression time. And the uh, second thing is a good hydration. And patient is good hydrated and uh, has a good maintenance uh, pressure for 140, 130. The risk of radial artery occlusion is many years, one person. It's true. But uh, when you change your blood pressure, when you don't control good hydration, I think it can be a reason of some problems. Absolutely. I think, you know, one final, I agree totally. And actually, you know, Evo, as, as quiet as he is, 
has alluded to the dilatation of the aperture with focal pressure in Quebec City with the first AIM radio. I still remember, you know, discussing with him in the elevator shaft over there. <laughs> and so these are not new, new concepts. You know, people have already thought about this. One issue was brought up, which is the focal versus entire radial thrombosis. And uh, we have actually looked at that anecdotally because we look at all of these people. The only association is the small radials develop lengthy occlusions, and the larger radials, when they occlude, develop relatively focal occlusions. And that's all I could, you know, tell you about that, is that we have seen a trend where tiny 1.8 millimeter, you know, diabetic woman radials, they occlude in long segments, whereas uh, when you do ultrasound on them. And when you see a 50-year-old man who probably had a bad batch of, you know, um, heparin and gets occlusion, uh, probably, you know, will get focal occlusion. Yeah, okay. I, I, I come to the, the, the thing also which is, I think is missing, and I guess Dr. Ziakas is working on this, and we have been begging for years, and I'm just saying that to the community. Instead of thinking the best device to minimize things, I guess that many operators believe that the hand and the finger should be the best one. I mean, I, for me, I mean, you know, when you take the time to compress the femoral and you were obsessed, I mean, I, I believe I cannot be beaten by any uh, closer devices. I, I believe it's a lack in the regional community, in the regional literature, that we don't have much more data showing maybe the efficacy of uh, manual compression, at least for diagnostic. And you know, there is many countries where it's not feasible anymore. Mm -hmm. I understand that Dr. Ziakas is working on this. I think that in India, I've been begging Tejas Patel to produce some results, yeah. but there's, I'm aware of only one paper many, many years ago, 100 patients, one occlusion. Mm -hmm. and, and I would suspect that maybe still we, ju we just, as the best in class comparator, we should have a trial or descriptive large population of manual compression after regulatory uh, access. I think it would be nice. You know, um, uh, Tony has some very good data that he showed yesterday, and it was, it was very counterintuitive. We, we, you know, I would have predicted that it would have lowered, but it actually increased occlusion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why. That's so. interesting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, oh, just sure. a short sure. question. Uh, sure. a very practical question. Uh, do you think that uh, you say that you show that the, uh, in the patent hemostasis group there were 74 percent of the red artery that were patent huh, mm -hmm. in, the, in this group? Huh? Uh, just a practical question. Do you think that we should apply the ulnar prophylactic compression? Only in those patients that are still uh, have still an occlusive compression despite the patent hemostasis protocol, or we should go for every patient. But I think the, the larger benefit is obtained is in this specific subpopulation. No? So it's, it's true. I think you know there's probably going to be a gradient of benefit, and so the higher risk populations will get a larger benefit. Although if you want to spend time discriminating them upfront, it's obviously not a bad idea. But the downside of ulnar compression was practically none. And so, you know, again, we are trying to dumb it down and just give it to every, everybody. Yeah, so. Jimmy, yes. So, uh, congratulations on the trial, which, Thank you. you know, as always with your research is an, an example of how to isolate variation and only investigate the thing that you want to truly investigate. It's kind of the opposite of a bivalent rudin trial. <laughs> <laughs> I removed oh. the topic this year. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I don't want to horrify you too much, but when I started doing radial procedures, we used to put two tourniquets on and pull them as tight as possible, you know. Mm. So it's, it's kind of amazing that we didn't get 100% radial occlusion rate then. That's true. So, um, you know, we're thinking about going back home uh, next week and trying to, you know, change our protocol to include what you've done. So uh, just a couple of practical things. That, how do you know where to put the ulnar compression? You know, how do you identify the right spot? And how much do you compress it? Do you pull it tight, or do you, so, how do you do it? So I think, you know, what we were doing for the trial was we were applying the pressure and then doing a Barbeau test to see if we got the ulnar occluded or not. Mm. Uh, now, we played around with the site all over the forearm. My initial impression was you'll get the biggest hemodynamic benefit if you compress very proximally because the ulnar has a lot of muscular branches. The problem is in the compartment, in the interosseous space, especially in an instrumented radial artery, in the normal volunteer, it works fine. But if you go in the cath lab, the radial artery is edematous. Even if you press the ulnar, you lose radial flow. 
because it's a closed space and because you're increasing the pressure, you, you press down the flow in, in the radial artery. So the only optimal point that I was able to find playing around all over the arm was at the Guyon's Canal, where the ulnar artery comes from inferior to superior and dives into the arm. And it's somewhat against the pisiform and hamet bone, where it's relatively reproducibly compressible to occlusion. You know, and if you talk to people like Sasco and others who do a lot of access over there, that's where they would like to puncture because it's easy to get, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, reliable compression there. So I would say compression as distal as you can get it. Uh. Well, just one question, I think, sure. uh, before finishing it. How did it change your everyday practice, this uh, trial? Because I think now you can, you can say the last message, I think, to this regular group. So my fear that a new nurse or technician will not pay attention to the radial artery is a lot less now than it used to be. I used to make rounds before the patient went home. I, my, my office is on the third floor and the cath lab is in the basement. So I would run between patients to check on the radial artery status. Now I'm less worried because the alarm will drive them crazy to look at it. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so maybe Zoltan, uh, thank you, uh, Sam. So I guess I will just say thank you to everybody. Uh, I think we have, personally, I believe we, we have succeeded to have a very nice meeting, very international flavor. It's very important. And I think that uh, we are working already to have another one next year. We don't know where yet. Uh, but uh, I will let my co-host uh, Zoltan give the final word of this meeting. Uh, thank you very much for coming to Budapest. I think uh, you will enjoy the city, uh, how long you will stay here, and uh, you enjoy the meeting. I think it was, uh, it was, uh, much, it was very scientific as uh, Olivier uh, planned the meeting, and uh, I hope next year we will go somewhere <laughs> to Cuba or to St. Petersburg. So I think everybody can have suggestions to, yes. to Olivier. We are open for suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> Cayman Ka Islands? Cayman Island. Thank you very much, Thank you.